evening. Welcome to Hard Fire. I'm your host, Mark Axon. It's my pleasure to welcome you to another exciting evening, the discussion of politics and current events from a libertarian perspective. Tonight is our second in a series of discussions with candidates for the libertarian nomination for President of the United States. And tonight, I'm delighted to be joined by, with John M. Finan. John is the chief executive of the New York City Consulting Group and quite possibly our next presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party. John, welcome to Hard Fire. Thank you, Mark. And also with us tonight is Anna Kuchma, a member of John's team, the new face of the Libertarian Party. Anna, thank you for coming as well. John, let's get right into it. Why are you running for president? <clears throat> what message are you bringing to the American people? Well, in essence, my party platform, uh, We the People, a fresh deal for America and the American people. The libertarian principles are things that have someone, somewhat gotten uh, strayed away from in our government. The Constitution, for example, which is something that, uh, if adhered to, it provides a quality of life in America based on what the Founding Fathers had intended for us to have. When I became involved with the Libertarian Party and the, uh, the people surrounding me in my campaign, we were thinking that because of the economic climate being the way it is, because of the social unrest that we're experiencing right now, we have factors that make uh, a change, uh, a reach for hope more palatable <laughs> to the American people. Well, people like Barack Obama keep talking about change, but I don't know what they're talking change for. What kind of change would you be interested in bringing to the American people? Well, when you bring up Barack, um, Barack had labeled himself as the candidate that would be uh, transcending race, it was one of his, his big uh, positions that he's taken. and. As you can see, that's quite uh, blown up into something over the past week or so with the comments that were made by his pastor. Mm -hmm. And I, I think he may be creating a, 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 a situation that is worse in terms of uh, healing uh, racial issues that uh, what's, co what's coming up and the way that he's handling it He's making it, uh, uh, he's exasperating, uh, exasperating the situation rather than creating a healing. He's not transcending the situation. He's in fact bringing us, I feel, back to the days of uh, Martin Luther King where he had worked <laughs> to transcend this. We've had this conversation and uh, the healing that, that was taking place is is almost getting disrupted by these by these words, these ra ra racist words, and I think it's creating a, a anger and hatred that didn't quite need to be brought up by the man who's transcending race in his in his position. Well, John, should race really be an issue? Should should people's skin color or religion or whether they're new immigrants to this country should that really be the issue? It's supposed to be transcended. I I, I think that we're beyond that. Um, I'd like Anna to read a piece that I have off my website that pertains to uh, affirmative action where I had written this a year or so ago and I'd like her to just bring that up. Surely. Thank you. In recent conversation, I have had it expressed to me at Lex Restaurant on Lexington and 90th Street that black people suffer from a lack of identity because of what was taken from them during slavery. Because addressing that, I have to articulate that recently, I needed to pay an electricity bill on 125th Street off of 5th Avenue on or about January 3rd, 2007. It is a crisis that these good people who are so busy working and just finished trying to make the holidays for their families as nice as possible are put into such a position to have to wait and pay and endure such hardship here at home when we are giving away billions and wasting billions overseas. One woman had her electricity cut off because she couldn't pay the bill.
that was so high only because neighbors had plugged in extension cords into her basement in order to get electricity in their homes. In finishing the initial thought regarding the identity of black people and affirmative action, here it is. You have arrived. You are attractive, articulate, wealthy, educated, empowered, intelligent, athletic, creative. You have it all, everything. It is a time to do away with affirmative action. It is an insult, and I have discussed it personally in numerous conversations, that there is agreement on this. It is offensive and not wanted or needed at this point. So be it. Economic inequality is the issue. Right, precisely, John. And in fact, doesn't the government, by having all of these affirmative action programs, force more economic inequality by keeping people in different classes, by pushing people down, or by not promoting the land of opportunity that this is supposed to be? That's exactly my point, and that's what we want to bring to our people. We want them to feel equal and empowered, to have this notion that someone needs extra help. At one time, this may have been the case, but these wrongs have been righted to an extent, and it creates a feeling of inferior feeling. And doesn't the law of unintended consequences mean that if you're going to favor this group, you're naturally disfavoring this other group? Why are we favoring um, uh, the poor blacks but not, for disfavor, not favoring poor Asians or favoring one group over another? Isn't it better to keep the government out of that business completely and just have it as a, a completely um, open, free market and let the market determine that I want to go to this person's store or I want to buy this person's product or I want to employ this person in my and, job? And these are libertarian economic principles that you're talking about and they create equality economically and societally. And that's why we need these changes to take place, and that's why we need the people of the United States to strongly consider a libertarian presidential candidate. All right, another area where the uh, mainline candidates are pushing is health care, how they're all going to be providing health care for everyone. What would, what would you say about that? Is it, is it a legitimate function of government to be caring for uh, the poor, the downtrodden, the people who don't have insurance, or people who want doctors? Or is this something that should also be left to the marketplace? Free market. I, I, I've spoken to doctors about this as well. When I formulate my opinions, I go speak to the people who are running medicine. Mm -hmm. At the Cato Institute, at their conference, uh, Cato is a uh, think tank, you know what Cato, of Cato course. is a libertarian uh, think tank, uh, economic, uh, very educated people, um, a very well respected organization. And the idea of uh, government controlled health care usually leads to uh, less in quality of health care. And it's truly not the government's position to be in this. You, you have a gap. With the doctors, you have a gap, the end user who pays, and that goes through the insurance company and the administration of the hospitals. And by the time the payment gets to the doctor, what's left is, is minuscule. Being a doctor is supposed to be a well-compensated, highly respected position in the society. It always, it always has mm -hmm. been. Now you have people going to school. How many years? For their medical degree, the stress, the cost involved, the the intellectual level of the person that needs to be present to become a doctor, mm -hmm. and at the end of the day, these these people they're not getting compensated. No, they're complaining about the insurance companies, which are regulated by the government, which is all this incestuous relationship with each other. So, it's, it's a, clearly it's an area that that the government should get out of, as opposed to continuing to regulate. And of course. Obama and Clinton can't top each other yet on, on who's going to have a plan to over-regulate uh, health care. And, and all, the quality will suffer and it'll cost the government. It, you cannot have government regulated health care. You just cannot have that. It's against the principles of the United States. It's against the principles of the Constitution, free market, and it will 
limit the liberty of the people by doing this. Now, you've mentioned the Constitution a few times, and I know that that's very important to you, as it is to most libertarians. Um, just uh, this week, for those viewers who are watching this afterwards, was the arguments in the Heller case in the Supreme Court on the Second Amendment. And I think they, you and I were chatting about that before. I think the arguments went quite well. Mm -hmm. But I want to compliment you. John has a very detailed um, uh, website. But when you get to the page on the Second Amendment, and it says, um, the right to keep and bear arms, you have one word, yes. So I think that that pretty much sums up the, uh, the Second Amendment argument. P pretty clear, but I, I, I do want to go one step further because uh, in my uh, television debate with uh, Steve Cubby, we did it on uh, Blog Talk Radio, I got into this with him. I do believe in the Second Amendment, the right and keep it and bear arms. It, it, is, it is your right. However, there's stress in urban centers that I do not think that concealed weapons um, and, and, and guns should be allowed in urban centers. Well, isn't the issue, though, that if we prevent um, the law-abiding citizens from having guns, like Dick Heller in, in the Washington, D.C., from having a handgun, mm -hmm. then, you know, the criminals, we're going to have them either way. Criminals are always going to be able to get them. I'm worried about crime. I'm worried about people getting shot. I'm worried about the stresses that exist in urban centers that don't exist out in less stressful environments. People do things with a hot head. And if you have a gun in your pocket, I, I think that there will be mistakes made. And I also, I, I believe in libertarianism. I believe in incrementalism in bringing our party's ideology forward. I'd like someone for the Libertarian Party to be truly considered as a, a viable presidential candidate. And because of this, you have to temper the philosophy to an extent because we do want to be appealing to the masses. We want to be electable. Okay, well, there are a couple of areas, John, where you, your views may be somewhat divergent from those of a lot of mainstream libertarians. One of those would be on fighting the terrorist threat abroad. I mean, most, most libertarians will agree that a legitimate function of government is to defend this country, to defend us, to defend this country. But the question is, um, to what degree do we go overseas to other countries in the argument that we're defending this country. For example, um, would continued support for the war for in Iraq be appropriate? Um, is it, uh, or does that violate a non-interventionist philosophy which most libertarians would hold? Well, the fact that some of my, I, my positions stray from the black and white libertarian party principle, it's true. I'm not going to adapt my true beliefs just to make myself fit the mold of a libertarian more. Mm -hmm. you, you need to have, the, you need honesty from your candidates. It's a responsibility to protect. And when we were on the show up in Albany with uh, Jeff Russell, the uh, Capital Outsider, mm -hmm. you have to listen to the generals. Also, incrementalism in our party's philosophies. General Petraeus, on April 9th, he's going to be giving a uh, uh, report. We have to listen to the generals. I want the war ended. Here. Peace. Okay? We're all for that. This is, this is what the people want. You have to listen to the people. Peace sign was... Uh, some of four letters, D and N, nuclear disarmament, is written in the peace sign. The people of the United States want the war ended. You have to listen to the people, what they want. Right now, that's the general consensus. And as commander-in-chief of the army, you want to protect the country, but you have to listen to the people, you have to listen to the generals. You don't want to bring the army back immediately at all costs. It is my intent. Sort of like the fall of Saigon again or something. Yeah, you, you know, you, we're, we're over there. There's been loss of life. Our young men and women, our soldiers, 
we have to take some responsibility for what's occurred, but I am definitely against war. <laughs> I don't think that the police actions uh, that are done arbitrarily, that aren't, Granada, that aren't, that, that aren't really war. You listen to Congress; it's a vote, and this is this is the way it should be. But peaceful things, like the Christmas tree, is one of the things that we also support. Now, this this argues in favor of your position on compassion, because it looks to me like yours you're trying to run a very compassionate loving campaign, which says that we should not be out there, um, you know, excluding people, but we should be much more inclusive. I think you have a line on the website that says, hang a dreidel from the, from the Christmas tree. This is actually a tree that I donated in my building's lobby. I'm hanging a menorah on this Christmas tree. We have um, a Kwanzaa corn. We have the Muslim symbol. Um, the moon and star is up here somewhere and there's a Christian church. We have, uh, it's a symbol of community, as if the, the Christmas tree is our community in all the different aspects. We have the New York Yankees represented here, and we That's even important. put the Red Sox on. Well, I don't know about the Red Sox. We separated we're, them. We're not playing, we're not playing in, in New England right now. But, but that's uh, how we are. Yeah. Everyone, every, we are not in New England, and you know, the Yankees is definitely a larger ornament and a better okay, position. Okay, well, that's, well that, that's the, yeah, yes, placement, is, placement yeah. is, uh, is very important. Definitely. So tell me, how you, tell me a little bit about yourself, John. Tell me about your background. I know that you started in, the, you were in the hotel business and you've been mm -hmm. in the real estate business. Tell, give, me, give me a... Hotels, real estate. Um, I've done a lot of philanthropic things. Uh, we mounted uh, uh, an effort to save um, 600 jobs at the Plaza Hotel, um, which was successful. The, a large portion of the hotel was, remains a hotel as opposed to all being mm -hmm. turned into condominiums. What about, uh, also were you involved with the Gramercy Park Tavern? Um, I purchased, as a preservationist, I purchased the bar from the Gramercy Park Hotel mm -hmm. from Ian Schrager. And that's the bar where Frank Sinatra was married at and Cary Grant. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're putting that in Aspen. We've restored it with the artwork to its original condition. We're going to have the Gramercy Park Bar, famous Gramercy Park Bar in uh, in Aspen, Colorado. I also do real estate development. I'm working with uh, Stan Stern right now. We're, we're trying to put together a project to build uh, 4,000 uh, low to moderate income um, housing units in uh, New York. And if people want to get involved in your campaign, as Anna has and several others, what, what, what should they be doing? What? Visit our website, www.johnmfinan.com. Visit the website, communicate with us. There's telephone numbers on there. Send us an email. You know, we'd love, we'd love to hear from the people. And there's a, a concert that we're doing. Um, Rob Canello is a friend of mine. He wrote a uh, song. He's a singer-songwriter. Yeah, he'll be playing for us in a few minutes. He'll be playing a little bit. We're doing a concert in uh, Central Park. And uh, we've invited uh, James Taylor to come. Uh, Nick Ashton, Rob, of course, is going to be playing, uh, Lenny Kravitz, and this will be to uh, highlight the campaign, and uh, it should be a nice time, it should be a nice, nice little concert, it's going to be an out outdoor concert. And, and the, um, what other events have you got planned? You're going to be going, I assume, to the New York and the national uh, conventions? All the, the conventions. Um, I, the next couple of months. I, I, I'm talking with uh, the David Letterman show. Um, they're considering having us on there as well for a similar, you know, to play the music and what that have you. That would be you. great. Stay away from the stupid dog trick stuff. That's yeah, we'll stay away from yeah, <laughs> yeah, that. No, that would be super. So. And um, if our viewers would like to get some more information about the Manhattan Libertarian Party, please visit our website at www.manhattanlp.org. And there you'll find links to the uh, national and state parties as well as uh, our newspaper, Surf City, and this fine television show, Hardfire. Again, that uh, website is www.manhattanlp.org. John, we have a couple of minutes left before we uh, have Rob uh, play the song that he's written for your campaign, which uh, we're all looking forward to hearing. But uh, can you tell me, what would a John Fine in presidency look like? Less taxes, less government, more freedom. 
Well, that would be terrific. If these we could, these, if are, we these are the things that were put together in the Libertarian Party. And w what comes with voting for me as a Libertarian to be president, if you like what I'm saying, and I was running for president as a Republican or a Democrat, and you voted me in, there would be no change. If you vote me in as a libertarian, and we have a libertarian third party president, if the people really want change, and they've got the guts to bring in a third party, John Finan, as a libertarian, there will definitely be change, 100%. As opposed to Obama's change, which is as opposed to pork belly deal same. making, gridlock, uh, t uh, earmarking of funds, as opposed to the status quo, which mm -hmm. no matter who you elect from either one of those parties, you're going to get the same thing. Nothing will change. That's what you get with a John Finan president. Well, that would be that would be terrific. Um, are there other em uh, issues that you wanted to emphasize? Is Anna? Got any other position papers that you wanted to bring to our attention? You know what? This would be nice to hear. This is uh, this is uh, Martin Luther King, Jr. A piece that that he wrote, and amazing man. And I'd, I'd like her to read this little little piece because it's 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 short but mm. it's really poignant. Thank you. The ultimate weakness of violence is that it is a descending spiral, begetting the very thing it seeks to destroy. Instead of diminishing evil, it multiplies it. Through violence, you may murder the liar, but you cannot murder the lie, nor establish the truth. Through violence, you murder the hater, but you do not murder hate. In fact, Violence merely increases hate. Returning violence, for violence multiplies violence. Adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Well, thank you very much. This shows that, um, of course, the Libertarian Party, being a party seeking peace and prosperity, is a party of compassion, which is similar to exactly the message that you want to get out to, to people, which is that we have a positive, a positive, upbeat thought, not we're going to put people in classes, we're going to keep this group down and this group down and this group down and people are going to do what they're told. We're going to empower people to have a little bit of freedom to think for themselves and do for themselves which would be a terrific change <laughs> from what we've seen. Well, that's what libertarianism offers us. And it was the, the libertarian ideas are from the founding fathers, Jefferson, the found, Ben Franklin. These gentlemen are the founding fathers and libertarianism, the freedom that they put forth is what we will get in a libertarian presidency. Now, I think you, that your theme is to some degree summarized in a song that Rob Canillo has written for us. Yeah, Rob Canillo, American singer, songwriter, very good friend of mine, has written a song that embodies the ideology of our campaign. And it's called I Can Hear You Calling, and he's here to play it for us. Uh, On now. this highway that we call life, you will witness sorrow and pain. You will witness pure hatred, so many horrible things to name. But you will witness acts of loving, so sweet in God's name. I can hear you calling, baby, heed this warning. It's not too late for us I can hear you calling Baby, heed this warning It's not too late for us On this road that we call life you will witness greed and rage You'll be tempted to look away now 
But you must not turn the page Cause you will witness acts of loving so sweet You can't explain I can hear you calling Baby, hear this warning it's not too late for us I can hear you calling Baby, heed this warning It's not too late for us No, no, baby on this road that we call life, you must choose wisely now. Pick a side now, there is no in betweens now. Cause your choice is all we have. I can hear you calling, baby, heed this warning. It's not too late for us I can I can hear you calling Baby, hear this warning It's not too late for us I can hear you calling Oh, well, that is great. I'm going to talk to our producer about having more music on these shows. Do that. I want to thank you, John Finan, for coming and pleasure. Anna for Pleasure's coming. Pleasure mine. Thank it's you, really Mark. A pleasure. Thank you. And Rob, and I thank our viewers for being with us tonight. Please join us next week for another exciting issue of Hard Fire. Hard Fire is funded in part by the Libertarian Party of New York, www.ny.lp.org. Catering for the cast and crew of Hard Fire is generously provided by Divine Taste, 150 7th Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 11215, 718-369-9548.